So this presentation is going to be split up in two parts. Part one is going to cover a submit a contract, and this is an actual contract that was presented to us by an agency, and we're going to go through it. It's about 12 to 13 minutes long. If you're not interested in that, then you can skip through that and go to this part two, which is going through the actual implementation setup of the asset and setup of the payment schedules and getting the amortization and interest schedules set up. So um, I'm a huge fan of Farside. thought this was hilarious. I hope this video gives you a good starting point for GASB 96, and I hope it's not too complex for you, and I hope you get a good chuckle from this. Okay, so this is, <coughs> excuse me, this is part one of the um, presentation, and this is where we are going to examine an actual contract that we received as part of a question from an agency and walk through this contract and look for um, what we're examining to see if it qualifies as an actual SBITDA. And once we determine if it qualifies as a SBITDA, what will be used to set up the implementation schedule. So I have redacted this contract just to make sure we keep any proprietary information um, confidential for the, um, the company that issued the contract. Um, but to give you a general idea of what the contract is about, it is an informational database. So it's not a traditional um, software subscription in the idea of what you think about as um, software uh, performing um, just traditional software, um, what, what software does in, in a traditional sense. But it still is software, one, because it is the company that has come up with this system has gone through and through proprietary, their, their proprietary information has compiled these sources of information into a database and has come up with algorithms to search this information and has provided an asset to this agency at a cost to the agency um, for the agency to avail themselves to the benefit of, of um, this um, asset for a certain amount of time. So it does qualify initially as a SBITDA. Um, of course, there's various hoops you have to jump through to um, keep going to see if it, if it continues on the road to becoming a fully fledged capitalizable SBITDA. So um, I'm just going to scroll down through this, this agreement to show you different parts of the contract that were key to determining the, the SBIT status are also key that you'll need to understand. So the first part that was interesting in this, con this contract was um, section two of the contract where it talks about the certification and it gives um, the number of users. Now, often what comes up in SBITAS is this concept of users. And um, you can have a variable number of users, or you can have a fixed number of users, or you can have some sort of hybrid number of users. And in this contract, they have this idea of um, some sort of hybrid where they al they're allowing for a total of 800 seats, so 400 government professional users and 400 support users. And then they have down here in this um, 2.4, this little note, and I'll explain to you what this note is saying, at least what I believe this note is saying. But there's, so there's a total of 800 seats, and uh, I'm not sure exactly which one is considered more valuable, but there's some, either the government uh, users or the support staff is, is more valuable. But they've come up with their pricing structure. Um, their quote is based off of this 50-50 allocation. And so at some point, you can't exceed more than 50% government or 50% support staff users. And so per this contract, they say you can issue 
a, um, a license and, uh, for support staff and government users, but we reserve the right during this contract to come in and audit your, um, your user number. And if you exceed this ratio, then we can come in and change the um, number of users. I mean, we can change the pricing structure. So hold on to that nugget of information for later when we go to the, when we talk about setting up the cost. But um, basically what's gonna happen is they have set the cost for a total of 800 users and um, it can go from zero to 800. But um, there, there's not really any per cost, per seat cost. Um, so you're not gonna pay any more or less whether or not you have one user or 799 users or 800 users. So um, that's the first thing that we're looking at in this contract. The second thing that's um, interesting in this contract is a SBITDA has to have a beginning date and an end date. It cannot be a perpetual offering. Um, so you can see right here, it says there's a commitment for the product offering with a, with a begin upon date and will continue for the last period um, so it has a start date and an end date. Um, so a Sabita starts and it ends. And once it ends, you're done. You can't log on anymore. Um, and then another thing is that it has to have a non-cancelable period to it. So it, it says right here, it says the subscribe in the start and end date has to be non-cancelable. Cancelable. So it says subscriber may not terminate this agreement for the convenience under general terms during this committed term. So the submitted status on this contract is looking pretty good. And we get another, um, another punch uh, of agreement. It says if subscriber terminates this agreement pursuant to this section, then subscriber will pay all charges incurred up to the date of termination. All right, so here is the pricing structure it sets out. And um, it is a per month charge. It escalates on a yearly basis. Um, so we have a fixed monthly charge that escalates on some sort of index. Um, so we know what the cost can be. So this is our capitalizable cost right here. And this cost is based upon um, the ratio of 50% government seats and 50% supporting staff. Now, um, one more thing I want to say about this on this 12,280, 12,649, and 13,029 per monthly charge is you need to make sure if this includes tax or not. If it, does include if it doesn't include tax and you're gonna be charged tax on this, you need to build in the tax on your capitalization costs because whatever your monthly bill is going to be, that is what, in whatever's gonna hit your general ledger, that is what you need to have broken down between your principal and interest. We saw this with GASB 87, um, a fair number of agencies, um, easy mistake to make, did not include the tax cost. So when it came time to allocate their principal and interest, they allocated their principal and interest, but then they were left over with this tax and they didn't know where to put it. So they either stuck it in the principal or they stuck it in the interest, which caused their amortization schedules to get all off, their asset schedules to get off, and then they had to do journal entries. So if there is tax, a tax component that is built into it, you need to go ahead and build it into the capitalization cost and amortize that as well. Now I did check on this particular bill because it's already started. So it started in February, 2022, and there was no tax being charged on this. So there, so I do not need to amortize tax um, or capitalize tax on this. One, another thing that I want to talk about here is, uh, go back to is um, where they talk, talked about earlier in the contract, if they audit this agency and they find at some point that maybe they have 60% government users and 40% support staff, 
then the company has the right, per the contract, to change this pricing structure. And if that does happen, and this pricing structure changes within the contract term, then the agency will need to come back and change the asset value to reflect the new, the new updated contract term um, because this, this is all part of the contract um, that they agreed to in the beginning. And of course, that's not known right now, but at some point that may change. And so that is GASB 96 addresses that um, we did not get into that in the guide because that's kind of one of those more nuanced things, but we did recommend that you read GASB 96 um, in its full glory and GASB 96 as published by the Government Accounting Standards Board did talk about this. So just if that does happen to your agency, you will need to go back and change your um, asset capitalization and your amortization schedules and it will change your depreciation going forward. Um, I'm just going to highlight this real, real quick and just talk about this as just as a throwaway. It says during the term, um, the, um, co the um, company that is offering this contract may make content and features available to the subscriber that are not included in this, con this contract. Um, let's say it is um, uh, services to, um, to help support this contract. Um, support services, maintenance support for Sabitas, um, education and training are not Sabitas. Do not capitalize those costs. They are not included in Sabitas. Sabitas are solely the software costs. Yes, right here, it says the support and training. Do not capitalize support and training as, as part of the Sabita capitalization cost. Don't do it. Um, GASB 96 tells you not to do it, don't do it. We saw this a lot in GASB 87. Um, a lot of the contracts for software, for assets have a clause in there that says non-availability of funds. And so um, agencies would say, well, we can cancel this agreement at any time because of this non-availability of funds. GASB 96 came down very clearly on this because um, this, is, this is not a reason to say uh, to not capitalize the Subita. So, um, just want to address this head on. If you say that a contract is cancelable because um, there's this, this clause in your contract that says uh, you might not get a sufficient appropriation of funds, not not a reason for for capital for not capitalizing uh, an, an asset. So here we have it. We've gone through this contract. I've shown you all the important parts of the contract that are relevant to setting up a Sabita. And um, I am 100% confident that this contract qualifies as a Sabita. It is three years um, and it is software. Uh, it has a start and end date and it is non-cancelable. So we're going to set this up in part two of the video. So we went through the contract and determined it was indeed a Sabita. So now we're going to set up the implementation file. And I've already pre-filled a lot of stuff out. So I'm just gonna take the time to walk through what, what we need to do here. So you're going to open up your implementation file that was sent out to you, um, uh, I think, um, on May 9th or last week. Um, and you're going to put in your agency number here. And so since we are the Comptroller General's office, I'm going to put our, our agency here from this drop down box. And you can see once you select your agency number, it fills in some information right here. 
So I put in my software subscription ID and you wanna make it um, short and sweet, not, not too long. And um, then you want to, and anything that has a heading of red is a formula and it will be locked. So you cannot fill it in right there. Um, but for example, if right here, that turns red, which tells me I need to fill that out. Uh, commencement of software description, subscription. Now, before I get started too, too far down this road, I just wanna say, if you have a contract, if you have a software that uh, is submitted that is not, that you are getting from another agency, you don't need to go through this whole process of filling out all this information. So I'm not even gonna waste your time on all this information. All you need to do is put in a software subscription ID, um, a software subscription description, and then scroll down, there is a column, and I hope this does not make you too sick, right here, column U. And it says, it's a software subscription from the Department of Technology or Department of Administration. This is narrowly written. It could be from another administration. It's probably gonna be from Department of Technology or Department of Administration, but it could be from another uh, another agency. You would just make sure you change, you would put in yes. You don't have to answer any other information here and then just scroll all the way over to notes and put what agency it's from. You're gonna have a lot of red all over this sheet for this line item. That's okay as long as it's coming from another agency. But if it's not coming from another agency, you can't have any red, it won't be accepted. Um, so if that's the case, if you have only software coming from another agency, you can just stop this video and you're done. But for everybody else, if you wanna keep on listening, let's keep on going. So um, we're gonna go back here. You're gonna fill out a software subscription description enough to give you a good idea of what the software does. The commencement of the software subscription and the expiration date. You're gonna get this from the contract. Now the contract played fast and cute with the dates. The contract said it started on uh, January 31st. It essentially gave us a free date, free day. Uh, so I am making an executive decision here to start that day on February 1st. So the commencement of the software, just to make it super easy, I just started it on 2-1-2022, and the expiration date is 1-31-2025. Um, it is a governmental fund, and how you find this out is you need to, to figure out where what fund it is going to be recorded in, it may be recorded in multiple funds. Um, you can go to this index of funds worksheet, see all the funds it's being recorded in, and then uh, you'll see uh, if it's governmental or not. If it's not governmental, then you'll put um, not, you know, not governmental. Um, so you can have governmental enterprise. Um, it's going to be a Sabita. Do you intend to purchase or keep? And then again, if it's in red, it's going to populate automatically. Um, purchase option amount, if applicable. So now you're getting into a section of the spreadsheet which asks you verification questions. And all this is trying to do is get, is weed out any items that are not submitted. So is the software accessible after the end of the subscription term? Or is this a perpetual license? So if you answer yes, to this, it's not a Sabita. And this is trying to get to things that um, are going to exist, is software that's going to exist after the end of the, the agreement. It, are, you going to be, is you going, are you going to be able to have it forever? It's not a Sabita. Does ownership transfer at the end of the subscription term? If the answer is yes, it's not a Sabita. Is the Sabita a component of the contract? Um, if the answer is yes, it doesn't necessarily make it not a Sabita. All this is prompting you to do is say, okay, a Sabita can oftentimes be embedded in a contract with equipment. So 
you can get some computer, a computer, you can get a phone system, uh, you can get equipment, and there is a portion of that that is for the equipment, and then there's a portion of that that is for software. And what you'll need to do then is you'll need to split the contract between the equipment, which is, falls under GASB 87, uh, which would go to Kelly uh, in the work you did last year with Kelly, and then there's the submitter portion, which is the software portion, which would fall under the work you're doing now. So you'd have to carve that up into two, two items. Um, is the software uh, description, is the software a de minimis portion of the contract? Um, if the answer is yes, then um, it says contact the CAFR team. Uh, really what, what this is trying to get at, if, if the software is a de minimis portion of the contract, then you really don't have a submitter here. It's, um, it's, it's probably just a regular old uh, GASB 87 lease. Um, and then we already covered column U at the beginning of part two introduction. Is this software? And then of course you can understand these two columns here. Um, and then the payment frequency. Uh, this would be specified in the contract, how you set up the payments as monthly, quarterly, biannual, or annual. So payment due at the start or end of period. In the contract, it wasn't super clear. It just said any time during uh, the month. So uh, you can pick uh, at that point. So I just put start. The rate, I am referencing this reference tab, which is the prime rate right here. Uh, I want to be very clear, this prime rate changes. You want to use, unless the, the rate is explicit, meaning it has been noted in your contract, then you want to use the implicit rate, which for the state of South Carolina, we are opting to use the prime rate. So the prime rate is, you're going to find that at the Federal Reserve, and that rate will be whatever the rate is at the date of the contract. So it's, it's not always going to be 3.5%. So if you're using 3.5% in three years or even in three, three months, because the way the rate environment is changing right now with the Federal Reserve, it is probably going to change. Um, you, you've got to check that. And I'm just putting a warning out there. That's probably going to be an easy thing for auditors to check uh, what your rate is that you're using and making sure that you are updating that rate as the rate is changing. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go back and re-update the rate every time it changes for assets that's already been created. But when you create an asset, you need to use the prime rate. If, it's, if you don't have a rate explicitly stated in your contract, you need to use the prime rate that's in effect at the time of the contract. Are there variable payments based on the future performance of the use of the asset? I just wanna make sure right here, even though the payment is changing, there are no variable payments. It, the payment is fixed. It's a fixed index payment. So we answer no to this question. If there was a portion of the contract that talked about um, after the 800 seat limit, then you would pay $100 per seat. Um, then you would answer yes to this question, and that $100 per seat over the 800 um, seat uh, limit established in the contract, that $100 would go into the contingency, into your contingency general ledger. So you would answer yes on this, and then you would describe the terms of the contingency payment. But because we don't have any contingency payments established in the contract, you're going to answer no. So I hope that's real clear here. Um, there are no payments made before the commencement. And I'm just going to put the initial payment amount, even though we know this payment amount will change throughout the years. And so the payment amount does change. So step two and step three are a little bit bundled to use the lease calculator to create the amortization schedules. You're going to use the same lease calculator that you used during GASB 87, and I'm going to pull this up. So here is the lease calculator. You want to make sure you update it for the next fiscal year. Um, 
right here you've got, um, so I've rolled it forward because this lease calculator is going to be in effect for fiscal year ending 2023. So I've updated it to end for 6-30-2023. Um, the lease commencement date, I've started it on 2-1-2022. If you had put in January 1st, January 31st, 2022, you would end up with 37 payments rather than 36 payments. So this is where I talked about earlier in, in this um, part two video about them being cutesy with the contract and giving you that one extra day. It causes a little trouble um, in this lease calculator because it gives you it gives you a it gives you a whole extra month of amortization and it's just not worth it. So. I chose to put um, this the real start date as February 1st. We know it's a governmental fund. What is the name of the fund that the lease is being recorded in? This would be the agency that you would put in, but because we're keeping the agency um, private, we're not gonna we're not gonna put that here. So this is the name, and you want this name to be the exact same name as what is on your implementation file. So you can see right here that I have linked it and I try to link these and keep my lease calculator linked to my implementation sheet and just roll forward the rows. Makes it easy. Sabita is going to be your asset choice for your capital asset category. It's going to be depreciable. The estimated useful life is three. You can see I have it linked here. Does the lease contain a purchase option? No, you could also link this because this is a direct question from the um, implementation, the master um, tab on the implementation schedule. And these questions are also on the implementation schedule. Um, I did not link them um, just because I knew off the bat um, what they were. So um, I like to list out all the months here. I've got a formula that I found um, while looking at date formulas. It is not listed in your standard formulas here and I, in your date formulas. I don't know why, but it's called E-date. So if you just put an E-date and reference whatever formula you're looking for and then do comma one, it'll add one month to your formula. And so I just list out all my months. And then I just put in um, 12 months worth of this one, 12 months worth of that one. And so I know I'm ending on the right month, which agrees to my contract. So once you're done with this, you've got all your information in, you'll just hit calculate lease information and it calculates it. Now, um, this, this macro does two different things. It calculates your um, amortization of your principal and interest and it also sets up the depreciation. If you're super wonky and you just love accounting and you want to understand everything, you're going to want to look at the depreciation. Don't. The depreciation, this, this, this is not for the depreciation. The depreciation is going to be handled on skis. All this should be used for is just this schedule right here. So what you're going to do with this schedule is you're just going to copy this bad boy right here and just hit control C and you're going to go back to your implementation file. You're going to go back to your payment schedules and when, when you're going to do this, it's going to accomplish step three. And I've already done it, but you're going to go in right here and you're going to paste it. And you're going to paste it right in here. And once you paste it in there, then you need to copy and paste I'm just delete this so you can see right now. You're going to copy and paste the Sabita ID from the master data, and you want it to be exactly one for one because it's a V lookup, so it needs to be the exact same. And then you're just going to go to the end of your principal and fill up. And you can see because you've filled out all your information. It's pulling your vendor information in. It's pulling your submit a type. It's got everything in there that you need. And so you can see you've got your principal amount, you've got your interest amount. Um, 
And if you scroll over, so you've got everything set up to start your reconciliation schedules to start for July 1st, 2022. Um, you've got your asset description. So the last section that you'll need to finish before you can turn in is the um, section for the general ledger coding and it's step four. And you'll just need to fill out for the inventory number and the serial number, just put um, in all caps T TBD for to be determined. You'll need to put the primary cost center, fund, functional area, and grant, which will probably be not relevant. You'll need to put the vendor number and the vendor name and make it the official vendor name, not um, don't guess at it. And the reason why you're gonna wanna do the official vendor name is it'll help you when it comes time to reconcile because you'll get a report from Bex with the vendor name and it'll help you um, do a cross-reference on this. And then you'll want to put the agreement notice, um, software subscription date. And here, if the, um, the start date is greater than um, July 1st, 2022, then you wanna put that um, date here if it's less than July 1st, 2022, then you wanna just put 2022-0701. Um, and then you then these right here are formulas, and actually I'm gonna change this right here so that it comes in as um, black because you're gonna to need to manually put this in here. Um, so these are formulas right here. This you're gonna manually put in, and this too you're gonna manually put in here. As well so you're going to put um, TBD, TBD for inventory number serial number and you're going to have to put the um, the date and you're need to put it in this format um, uh, 2022 or 2022 depending on what the start date is and then a two-digit month and two-digit start date <clears throat> and that's it you're done um, you can turn in the file um, once you've got all your uh, Sabitas listed. You have um, 300 rows, I believe, to fill in if you have up to 300. If you need more, contact us. I don't think you'll need more. Um, but um, that should be it. And you are ready to turn this in. Let's just say you only have one Sabita you're ready to turn this in to us. And the next steps will be for us to um, verify this looks right. We're gonna check your Create Asset tab, make sure it looks right. We're gonna check your Abzon tab, make sure it looks right. And then once everything looks right, we're gonna clear you guys to set up your asset and skis. Now remember, the asset and skis setup will not happen until after July 1st, 2022. Do not set up your assets until after July 1st, 2022. So this is the implement, implementation file that's due um, June 10th. This is the walkthrough. I hope this answers questions. I hope this relieves some anxiety that you guys have. If you have any questions, please contact James Torbert or myself, Catherine Kitten.